replied the general. How so, returned the viceroy. Don Quixote. Chapter Lxi 760. Because, said the general, against all law, reason, and usages of war they have killed on my hands two of the best soldiers on board these galleys, and I have sworn to hang every man that I have taken, but above all this youth who is the rice of the brigantine, and he pointed to him as he stood with his hands already bound and the rope round his neck, ready for death. The viceroy looked at him, and seeing him so well minus favored, so graceful, and so submissive, he felt a desire to spare his life, the comeliness of the youth furnishing him at once with a letter of recommendation. He therefore questioned him, saying, Tell me, Rice, art thou Turk, Moor, or Renegade? To which the youth replied, Also in Spanish, I am neither Turk, nor Moor, nor Renegade. What art thou, then, said the viceroy? A Christian woman, replied the youth. A woman and a Christian, in such a dress and in such circumstances. It is more marvelous than credible, said the viceroy. Suspend the execution of the sentence, said the youth. Your vengeance will not lose much by waiting while I tell you the story of my life. What heart could be so hard as not to be softened by these words, at any rate so far as to listen to what the unhappy youth had to say? The general bade him say what he pleased, but not to expect pardon for his flagrant offense. With this permission the youth began in these words. Born of Morisco parents, I am of that nation, more unhappy than wise, upon which of late a sea of woes has poured down. In the course of our misfortune I was carried to Barbary by two uncles of mine, for it was in vain that I declared I was a Christian, as in fact I am, and not a mere pretended one, or outwardly, but a true Catholic Christian. It availed me nothing with those charged with our sad expatriation to protest this, nor would my uncles believe it, on the contrary, they treated it as an untruth and a subterfuge set up to enable me to remain behind in the land of my birth, and so, more by force than of my own will, they took me with them. I had a Christian mother, and a father who was a man of sound sense, and a Christian too. I imbibed the Catholic faith with my mother's milk, I was well brought up, and neither in word nor in deed did I, I think, show any sign of being a Morisco. To accompany these virtues, for such I hold them, my beauty, if I possess any, grew with my growth, and great as was the seclusion in which I lived it was not so great, but that a young gentleman, Don Gaspar Gregorio by name, eldest son of a gentleman who is lord of a village near ours, contrived to find opportunities of seeing me. How he saw me, how we met, how. Don Quixote Chapter Lxi 761 His heart was lost to me, and mine not kept from him, would take too long to tell, especially at a moment when I am in dread of the cruel cord that threatens me interposing between tongue and throat, I will only say, therefore, that Don Gregorio chose to accompany me in our banishment. He joined company with the Moriscos who were going forth from other villages, for he knew their language very well, and on the voyage he struck up a friendship with my two uncles who were carrying me with them, for my father, like a wise and far minus sighted man, as soon as he heard the first edict for our expulsion, quitted the village and departed in quest of some refuge for us abroad. He left hidden and buried, at a spot of which I alone have knowledge, a large quantity of pearls and precious stones of great value, together with a sum of money in gold cruzados and doubloons. He charged me on no account to touch the treasure, if by any chance they expelled us before his return. I obeyed. Him, and with my uncles, as I have said, and others of our kindred and neighbors, passed over to Barbary, and the place where we took up our abode was Algiers, much the same as if we had taken it up in hell itself. The king heard of my beauty and report told him of my wealth, which was in some degree fortunate for me. He summoned me before him and asked me what part of Spain I came from and what money and jewels I had. I mentioned the place and told him the jewels and money were buried there, but that they might easily be recovered if I myself went back for them. All this I told him, in dread lest my beauty and not his own covetousness should influence him. While he was engaged in conversation with me, they brought him word that in company with me was one of the handsomest and most graceful youths that could be imagined. I knew at once that they were speaking of Don Gaspar Gregorio, whose comeliness surpasses the most highly vaunted beauty. I was troubled when I thought of the danger he was in, 
for among those barbarous Turks affair. Youth is more esteemed than a woman, be she ever so beautiful. The king immediately ordered him to be brought before him that he might see him, and asked me if what they said about the youth was true. I then, almost as if inspired by heaven, told him it was, but that I would have him to know it was not a man, but a woman like myself, and I entreated him to allow me to go and dress her in the attire proper to her, so that her beauty might be seen to perfection, and that she might present herself before him with less embarrassment. He bade me go by all means, and said that the next day, we should discuss the plan to be adopted for my return to Spain to carry away the hidden treasure. I saw Don Gaspar, I told him the danger he was in if he let it be seen he was a man, I dressed him as a Moorish woman, and that same afternoon I brought him before the king, who was charmed when he saw him, and resolved to keep the damsel, and make a present of her to the grand senior, and to avoid the risk she might run among the women of his seraglio, and distrustful of himself, he commanded her to be placed in the house of some Moorish ladies of rank who would protect and attend to her, and thither he was taken at once. What we both suffered, for I cannot deny that I love him, may be left to the imagination of those who are separated if they love one and other dearly. The king then arranged that I should return to Spain in this brigantine, and that two Turks, those who killed your soldiers, should accompany me. There also came with me this Spanish renegade Minas and here she pointed to him, who had first spoken Minas whom I know to be secretly a Christian, and to be more desirous of being left in Spain than of returning to Barbary. The rest of the crew of the brigantine are Moors and Turks, who. Don Quixote Chapter LC 762 Merely serve as rowers. The two Turks, greedy and insolent, instead of obeying the orders we had to land me, and this renegade in Christian dress, with which we came provided, on the first Spanish ground we came to, chose to run along the coast and make some prize if they could, fearing that if they put us ashore first, we might, in case of some accident befalling us, make it known that the brigantine was at sea and thus, if there happened to be any galleys on the coast, they might be taken. We sighted this shore last night, and knowing nothing of these galleys, we were discovered, and the result was what you have seen. To sum up, there is Don Gregorio in woman's dress, among women, in imminent danger of his life, and here am I, with hands bound, in expectation, or rather in dread, of losing my life, of which I am already weary. Here, sirs, ends my sad story, as true as it is unhappy, all I ask of. You is to allow me to die like a Christian, for, as I have already said, I am not to be charged. With the offense of which those of my nation are guilty, and she stood silent, her eyes filled with moving tears, accompanied by plenty from the bystanders. The viceroy, touched with compassion, went up to her without speaking and untied the cord that bound the hands of the Moorish girl. But all the while the Morisco Christian was telling her strange story, an elderly pilgrim, who had come on board of the galley at the same time as the viceroy, kept his eyes fixed upon her, and the instant she ceased speaking he threw himself at her feet, and embracing them said in a voice broken by sobs and sighs, O Anna Felix, my unhappy daughter, I am thy father Ricote, come back to look for thee, unable to live without thee, my soul that thou art. At these words of his, Sancho opened his eyes and raised his head, which he had been holding down, brooding over his unlucky excursion, and looking at the pilgrim he recognized in him that same Ricote he met the day he quitted his government, and felt satisfied that this was his daughter. She being now unbound embraced her father, mingling her tears with his, while he addressing the general and the viceroy said, This, sirs, is my daughter, more unhappy in her adventures than in her name. She is Anna Felix, surnamed Ricote, celebrated as much for her own beauty as for my wealth. I quitted my native land in search of some shelter or refuge for us abroad, and having found one in Germany, I returned in this pilgrim's dress, in the company of some other German pilgrims, to seek my daughter and take up a large quantity of treasure I had left buried. My daughter I did not find, the treasure I found and have with me, and now, in this strange roundabout way you have seen, I find the treasure that more than all makes me rich, my beloved daughter. If our innocence and her tears and mine can with strict justice open the door to clemency, extend it to us, for we never had any intention of injuring you, nor do we sympathize with the aims of our people, who have been justly banished. I know Ricote well, said Sancho at this, 
and I know too that what he says about Anna Felix being his daughter is true, but as to those other particulars about going and coming and having good or bad intentions, I say nothing. Don Quixote Chapter LC 763 While all present stood amazed at this strange occurrence the general said, at any rate your tears will not allow me to keep my oath, live, fair Anna Felix, all the years that heaven has allotted you, but these rash insolent fellows must pay the penalty of the crime they have committed, and with it he gave orders to have the two Turks who had killed his two soldiers hanged at once at the yard minus arm. The viceroy however, begged him earnestly not to hang them, as their behavior savored rather of madness than of bravado. The general yielded to the viceroy's request, for revenge is not easily taken in cold blood. They then tried to devise some scheme for rescuing Don Gaspar Gregorio from the danger in which he had been left. Ricote offered for that object more than 2,000 ducats that he had in pearls and gems, they proposed several plans, but none so good as that suggested by the renegade. Already mentioned, who offered to return to Algiers in a small vessel of about six banks. Manned by Christian rowers, as he knew where, how, and when he could and should land, nor was he ignorant of the house in which Don Gaspar was staying. The general and the viceroy had some hesitation about placing confidence in the renegade and entrusting him with the Christians who were to row, but Anna Felix said she could answer for him, and her father offered to go and pay the ransom of the Christians if by any chance they should not be forthcoming. This, then, being agreed upon, the viceroy landed, and Don Antonio Moreno took the fair Morisco and her father home with him, the viceroy charging him to give them the best reception and welcome in his power, while on his own part he offered all that house contained for their entertainment, so great was the good minus will and kindliness the beauty of Ana Felix had infused into his heart. Don Quixote Chapter LC 764 Chapter LXIV Treating of the adventure which gave Don Quixote more unhappiness than all that had hitherto befallen him. The wife of Don Antonio Moreno, so the history says, was extremely happy to see Ana Felix in her house. She welcomed her with great kindness, charmed as well by her beauty as by her intelligence, for in both respects the fair Morisco was richly endowed, and all the people of the city flocked to see her as though they had been summoned by the ringing of the bells. Don Quixote told Don Antonio that the plan adopted for releasing Don Gregorio was not a good one, for its risks were greater than its advantages, and that it would be better to land himself with his arms and horse in Barbary, for he would carry him off in spite of the whole Moorish host, as Don Gaiferos carried off his wife Melisendra. Remember, your worship, observed Sancho on hearing him say so, Senor Don Gaiferos carried off his wife from the mainland and took her to France by land, but in this case, if by chance we carry off Don Gregorio, we have no way of bringing him to Spain, for there's the sea between. There's a remedy for everything except death, said Don Quixote. If they bring the vessel close to the shore we shall be able to get on board though all the world strive to prevent us. Your worship hits it off mighty well and mighty easy, said Sancho, but it's a long step from saying to doing, and I hold to the renegade, for he seems to me an honest good minus hearted fellow. Don Antonio then said that if the renegade did not prove successful, the expedient of the great Don Quixote's expedition to Barbary should be adopted. Two days afterwards the renegade put to sea in a light vessel of six oars a minus side manned by a stout crew, and two days later the galleys made sail eastward, the general having begged the viceroy to let him know all about the release of Don Gregorio and about Ana Felix, and the viceroy promised to do as he requested. One more as Don Quixote went out for a stroll along the beach, arrayed in full armor for, as he often said, that was his only gear, his only rest the fray, and he never was without it for a moment, he saw coming towards him a knight, also in full armor, with a shining moon painted on his shield who, on approaching sufficiently near to be heard, said. Don Quixote Chapter LXIV 765 In a loud voice, a Addressing himself to Don Quixote, illustrious knight, and never sufficiently extolled Don Quixote of La Mancha, I am the knight of the white moon, whose unheard minus of achievements will perhaps have recalled him to thy memory. I come to do battle with thee and prove the might of thy arm, to the end that I make thee acknowledge and confess that my lady, 
let her be who she may, is incomparably fairer than thy Dulcinea del Toboso. If thou dost acknowledge this fairly and openly, thou shalt escape death and save me the trouble of inflicting it upon thee, if thou fightest, and I vanquish thee, I demand no other satisfaction than that, laying aside arms and abstaining from going in quest of adventures, thou withdraw and betake thyself to thine own village for the space of a year, and live there without putting hand to sword, in peace and quiet and beneficial repose, the same being needful for the increase of thy substance and the salvation of thy soul, and if thou dost vanquish me, my head shall be at thy disposal, my arms and horse thy spoils, and the renown of my deeds transferred and added to thine. Consider which will be thy best course, and give me thy answer speedily, for this day is all the time I have for the dispatch of this business. Don Quixote was amazed and astonished, as well at the night of the white moon's arrogance, as at his reason for delivering the defiance, and with calm dignity he answered him, Knight of the white moon, of whose achievements I have never heard until now, I will venture to swear you have never seen the illustrious Dulcinea, for had you seen her I know you would have taken care not to venture yourself upon this issue, because the sight would have removed all doubt from your mind that there ever has been or can be a beauty to be compared with hers, and so, not saying you lie, but merely that you are not correct in what you state, I accept your challenge, with the conditions you have proposed, and at once, that the day you have fixed may not expire, and from your conditions I accept only that of the renown of your achievements being transferred to me, for I know not of what sort they are nor what they may amount to. I am satisfied with my own, such as they be. Take. Therefore, the side of the field you choose, and I will do the same, and to whom God shall. Give it may Saint Peter at his blessing. The knight of the white moon had been seen from the city, and it was told the viceroy how he was in conversation with Don Quixote. The viceroy, fancying it must be some fresh adventure got up by Don Antonio Moreno, or some other gentleman of the city, hurried out at once to the beach accompanied by Don Antonio and several other gentlemen, just as Don Quixote was wheeling Rocinante round in order to take up the necessary distance. The viceroy upon this, seeing that the pair of them were evidently preparing to come to the charge, put himself between them, asking them what it was that led them to engage in combat all of a sudden in this way. The Knight of the White Moon replied that it was a question of precedence of beauty, and briefly told him what he had said to Don Quixote, and how the conditions of the defiance agreed upon on both sides had been accepted. The viceroy went over to Don Antonio, and asked in a low voice did he know who the knight of the white moon was, or was it some joke they were playing on Don Quixote? Don Antonio replied that he neither knew who he was nor whether the defiance was in joke or in earnest. Don Quixote Chapter LXIV 766 this answer left the viceroy in a state of perplexity, not knowing whether he ought to let the combat go on or not, but unable to persuade himself that it was anything but a joke he fell back, saying, if there be no other way out of it, gallant knights, except to confess or die, and Don Quixote is inflexible, and your worship of the white moon still more so, in God's hand be it, and fall on. He had the white Moon thanked the viceroy in courteous and well minus chosen words for the permission he gave them, and so did Don Quixote, who then, commending himself with all his heart to heaven and to his Dulcinea, as was his custom on the eve of any combat that awaited him, proceeded to take a little more distance, as he saw his antagonist was doing the same, then, without blast of trumpet or other warlike instrument to give them the signal to charge, both at the same instant wheeled there. Horses, and he of the white moon, being the swifter, met Don Quixote after having traversed two minus thirds of the course, and there encountered him with such violence that, without touching him with his lance, for he held it high, to all appearance purposely, he hurled Don Quixote and Rocinante to the earth, a perilous fall. He sprang upon him at once, and placing the lance over his visor said to him, You are vanquished, Sir Knight, nay dead unless you admit the conditions of our defiance. Don Quixote, bruised and stupefied, without raising his visor said in a weak feeble voice as if he were speaking out of a tomb, Dulcinea del Toboso is the fairest woman in the world, and I the most unfortunate knight on earth, it is not fitting that this truth should suffer by my feebleness, drive your lance home, sir knight, and take my life, since you have taken away my honor. That will I not, in sooth, said he of the white moon, live the fame of the lady Dulcinea's beauty undimmed as ever 
All I require is that the great Don Quixote retire to his own home for a year, or for so long a time as shall by me be enjoined upon him, as we agreed before engaging in this combat. The Viceroy, Don Antonio, and several others who were present heard all this, and heard too how Don Quixote replied that so long as nothing in prejudice of Dulcinea was demanded of him, he would observe all the rest like a true and loyal knight. The engagement given, he of the white moon wheeled about, and making obeisance to the viceroy with a movement of the head, rode away into the city at a half gallop. The viceroy bade Don Antonio hasten after him, and by some means or other find out who he was. They raised Don Quixote up and uncovered his face, and found him pale and bathed with sweat. Rocinante from the mere hard measure he had received lay unable to stir for the present. Sancho, wholly dejected and woebegone, knew not what to say or do. He fancied that all was a dream, that the whole business was a piece of enchantment. Here was his master defeated, and bound not to take up arms for a year. He saw the light of the glory of his achievements obscured, the hopes of. The promises lately made him swept away like smoke before the wind, Rocinante, he feared. Was crippled for life, and his master's bones out of joint for if he were only shaken out of his madness it would be no small luck. In the end they carried him into the city in a. Don Quixote Chapter LXIV 767 Hand minus chair which the viceroy sent for, and thither the viceroy himself returned, cager to. Ascertain who this knight of the white moon was who had left Don Quixote in such a sad. Plight Don Quixote Chapter LXIV 768 Chapter LXV Wherein is made known who the knight of the White Moon was, likewise Don Gregorio's release, and other events. Don Antonio Moreno followed the knight of the White Moon and a number of boys followed him too, nay pursued him, until they had him fairly housed in a hostel in the heart of the city. Don Antonio, eager to make his acquaintance, entered also. A squire came out to meet him and remove his armor, and he shut himself into a lower room, still attended by Don Antonio, whose bread would not bake until he had found out who he was. He of the white moon, seeing then that the gentleman would not leave him, said, I know very well, senor, what you have come for. It is to find out who I am, and as there is no reason why I should conceal it from you, while my servant here is taking off my armor I will tell you the true state of the case without leaving out anything. You must know, senor, that I am called the bachelor Samson Carrasco. I am of the same village as Don Quixote of La Mancha, whose craze and folly make all of us who know him feel pity for him, and I am one of those who have felt it most, and persuaded that his chance of recovery lay in quiet and keeping at home and in his own house, I hit upon a device for keeping him there. Three months ago, therefore, I went out to meet him as a knight minus errant, under the assumed name of the Knight of the Mirrors, intending to engage him in combat and overcome him without hurting him, making it the condition of our combat that the vanquished should be at the disposal of the victor. What I meant to demand of him, for I regarded him as vanquished already, was that he should return to his own village, and not leave it for a whole year, by which time he might be cured. But fate ordered it otherwise, for he vanquished me and unhorsed me, and so my plan failed. He went his way, and I came back conquered, covered with shame, and sorely bruised by my fall, which was a particularly dangerous one. But this did not quench my desire to meet him again and overcome him, as you have seen to minus day. And as he is so scrupulous in his observance of the laws of night minus errantry, he will, no doubt, in order to keep his word, obey the injunction I have laid upon him. This, senor, is how the matter stands, and I have nothing more to tell you. I implore of you not to betray me, or tell Don Quixote who I am, so that my honest endeavors may be successful, and that a man of excellent wits minus were he only rid of the fooleries of chivalry minus may get them back again. O oh, senor, said Don Antonio, may God forgive you the wrong you have done the whole world in trying to bring the most amusing madman in it back to his senses. Do you not see, senor, that the gain by Don Quixote's sanity can never equal the enjoyment his crazes give? But my belief is that all the senor bachelor's pains will be of no avail to bring a man so hopelessly cracked to his senses again, and if it were not uncharitable, 
I would say may Don Quixote never be cured, for by his recovery we lose not only his own drolleries. Don Quixote Chapter LXV769 But his squire Sancho Panza's too, any one of which is enough to turn melancholy itself into merriment. However, I'll hold my peace and say nothing to him, and we'll see whether I am right in my suspicion that Senor Carrasco's efforts will be fruitless. The bachelor replied that at all events the affair promised well, and he hoped for a happy result from it, and putting his services at Don Antonio's commands he took his leave of him, and having had his armor packed at once upon a mule, he rode away from the city the same day on the horse he rode to battle, and returned to his own country without meeting any adventure calling for record in this voracious history. Don Antonio reported to the viceroy what Carrasco told him, and the viceroy was not very well pleased to hear it, for with Don Quixote's retirement there was an end to the amusement of all who knew anything of his mad doings. Six days did Don Quixote keep his bed, dejected, melancholy, moody and out of sorts, brooding over the unhappy event of his defeat. Sancho strove to comfort him, and among other things he said to him, Hold up your head, senor, and be of good cheer if you can, and give thanks to heaven that if you have had a tumble to the ground you have not come off with a broken rib, and, as you know that where they give they take, and that there are not always fletches where there are pegs, a fig for the doctor, for there's no need of him to cure this ailment. Let us go home, and give over going about in search of adventures in strange lands and places, rightly looked at, it is I that am the greater loser, though it is your worship that has had the worse usage. With the government I gave up all wish to be a governor again, but I did not give up all longing to be a count, and that will never come to pass if you're. Worship gives up becoming a king by renouncing the calling of chivalry, and so my hopes are going to turn into smoke. Peace, Sancho, said Don Quixote, thou sayest my suspension and retirement is not to exceed a year, I shall soon return to my honored calling, and I shall not be at a loss for a kingdom to win and a county to bestow on thee. May God hear it and sin be deaf, said Sancho, I have always heard say that a good hope is better than a bad holding. As they were talking Don Antonio came and looking extremely pleased and exclaiming, Reward me for my good news, Senor Don Quixote. Don Gregorio and the renegade who went for him have come ashore minus ashore do I say. They are by this time in the viceroy's house, and will be here immediately. Don Quixote cheered up a little and said, Of a truth I am almost ready to say I should have been glad had it turned out just the other way, for it would have obliged me to cross over to Barbary or by the might of my arm I should have restored to liberty, not only Don Gregorio, but all the Christian captives there are in Barbary. But what am I saying? Don Quixote Chapter LXV 770 Miserable being that I am? Am I not he that has been conquered? Am I not he that has been overthrown? Am I not he who must not take up arms for a year? Then what am I making professions for? What am I bragging about, when it is fitter for me to handle the distaff than the sword? No more of that, senor, said Sancho. Let the hen live, even though it be with her pip, today for thee, and to minus morrow for me, in these affairs of encounters and wax one must not mind them, for he that falls to minus day may get up to minus morrow, unless indeed he chooses to lie in bed, I mean gives way to weakness, and does not pluck up fresh spirit for fresh battles. Let your worship get up now to receive Don Gregorio, for the household seems to be in a bustle, and no doubt he has come by this time, and so it proved, for as soon as Don Gregorio and the renegade had given the viceroy an account of the voyage out and home, Don Gregorio, eager to see Ana Felix, came with the renegade to Don Antonio's house. When they carried him away from Algiers he was in woman's dress. On board the vessel, however, he exchanged it for that of a captive who escaped with him but in whatever dress he might be he looked like one to be loved and served and esteemed, for he was surpassingly well minus favored, and to judge by appearances some seventeen or eighteen years of age. Recoat. And his daughter came out to welcome him, the father with tears, the daughter with bashfulness. They did not embrace each other, for where there is deep love there will never be overmuch boldness. Seen side by side, the comeliness of Don Gregorio and the beauty of Ana Felix were the admiration of all who were present. It was silence that spoke for the lovers at that moment, 
and their eyes were the tongues that declared their pure and happy feelings. The renegade explained the measures and means he had adopted to rescue Don Gregorio, and Don Gregorio at no great length, but in a few words, in which he showed that his intelligence was in advance of his years, described the peril and embarrassment he found himself in among the women with whom he had sojourned. To conclude, Ricote liberally recompensed and rewarded as well the renegade as the men who had rowed, and the renegade effected his readmission into the body of the church and was reconciled with it. And from a rotten limb became by penance and repentance a clean and sound one. Two days later the viceroy discussed with Don Antonio the steps they should take to enable Ana Felix and her father to stay in Spain, for it seemed to them there could be no objection to a daughter who was so good a Christian and a father to all appearance so well disposed remaining there. Don Antonio offered to arrange the matter at the capital, whither he was compelled to go on some other business, hinting that many a difficult affair was settled there with the help of favor and bribes. Nay, said Ricote, who was present during the conversation, it will not do to rely upon favor or bribes, because with the great Don Bernardino de Velasco, Conde de Salazar, to whom His Majesty has entrusted our expulsion, neither entreaties nor promises, bribes nor appeals to compassion, are of any use, for though it is true he mingles mercy with justice, still, seeing that the whole body of our nation is tainted and corrupt, he applies to it the cautery that burns rather than the salve. That soothes, and thus, by prudence, sagacity, care. Don Quixote Chapter LXV 771 And the fear he inspires, he has borne on his mighty shoulders the weight of this great policy and carried it into effect, all our schemes and plots, importunities and wiles, being ineffectual to blind his Argus eyes, ever on the watch lest one of us should remain behind in concealment, and like a hidden root come in course of time to sprout and bear poisonous fruit in Spain, now cleansed, and relieved of the fear in which our vast numbers kept it. Heroic resolve of the great Philip III, and unparalleled wisdom, to have entrusted it to the said Don Bernardino de Velasco. At any rate, said Don Antonio, when I am there I will make all possible efforts, and let heaven do as pleases it best, Don Gregorio will come with me to relieve the anxiety which his parents must be suffering on account of his absence, Ana Felix will remain in my house with my wife, or in a monastery, and I know the viceroy will be glad that the worthy Ricote should stay with him until we see what terms I can make. The viceroy agreed to all that was proposed, but Don Gregorio on learning what had passed declared he could not and would not on any account leave Ana Felix, however, as it was his purpose to go and see his parents and devise some way of returning for her, he fell in with the proposed arrangement. Ana Felix remained with Don Antonio's wife and Ricote in the viceroy's house. The day for Don Antonio's departure came, and two days later that for Don Quixote's and Sancho's, for Don Quixote's fall did not suffer him to take the road sooner. There were tears and sighs, swoonings and sobs, at the parting between Don Gregorio and Ana Felix. Ricote offered Don Gregorio a thousand crowns if he would have them, but he would not take any save five which Don Antonio lent him, and he promised to repay at the capital. So the two of them took their departure, and Don Quixote and Sancho afterwards, as has been already said, Don Quixote without his armor and in traveling gear, and Sancho on foot, Dapple being loaded with the armor. Don Quixote Chapter LXV 772 Chapter LXVI Which treats of what he who reads will see, or what he who has it read to him will hear. As he left Barcelona, Don Quixote turned gaze upon the spot where he had fallen. Here Troy was, said he, here my ill minus luck, not my cowardice, robbed me of all the glory I had won, here fortune made me the victim of her caprices, here the luster of my achievements was dimmed, here, in a word, fell my happiness never to rise again. Senor, said Sancho on hearing this, it is the part of brave hearts to be patient in adversity just as much as to be glad in prosperity. I judge by myself, for, if when I was a governor I was glad, now that I am a squire and on foot I am not sad, and I have heard say that she whom commonly they call fortune is a drunken whimsical jade, and, what is more, blind, and therefore neither sees what she does, nor knows whom she casts down or whom she sets up. Thou art a great philosopher, Sancho, said Don Quixote, thou speakest very sensibly, I know not who taught thee. 
But I can tell thee there is no such thing as fortune in the world, nor does anything which takes place there, be it good or bad, come about by chance, but by the special preordination of heaven, and hence the common saying that each of us is the maker of his own fortune. I have been that of mine, but not with the proper amount of prudence, and my self minus confidence has therefore made me pay dearly, for I ought to have reflected that Rocinante's feeble strength could not resist the mighty bulk of the knight of the white moon's horse. In a word, I ventured it, I did my best, I was overthrown, but though I lost my honor I did not lose nor can I lose the virtue of keeping my word. When I was a knight minus errant, daring and valiant, I supported my achievements by hand and deed, and now that I am a humble squire I will support my words by keeping the promise I have given. Forward then, Sancho my friend, let us go to keep the year of the novitiate in our own country, and in that seclusion we shall pick up fresh strength to return to the by me never minus forgotten calling of arms. Senor, return Sancho, traveling on foot is not such a pleasant thing that it makes me feel disposed or tempted to make long marches. Let us leave this armor hung up on some tree, instead of someone that has been hanged, and then with me on Dapple's back and my feet off the ground we will arrange the stages as your worship pleases to measure them out, but to suppose that I am going to travel on foot, and make long ones, is to suppose nonsense. Thou sayest well, Sancho, said Don Quixote, let my armor be hung up for a trophy. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 773 and under it or round it we will carve on the trees what was inscribed on the trophy of Roland's armor minus. These let none move who dareth not his might with Roland prove. That's the very thing, said Sancho, and if it was not that we should feel the one of Rocinante on the road, it would be as well to leave him hung up too. And yet, I had rather not have either him or the armor hung up, said Don Quixote, that it may not be said, for good service a bad return. Your worship is right, said Sancho, for, as sensible people hold, the fault of the ass must not be laid on the pack minus saddle, and, as in this affair the fault is your worship's, punish yourself and don't let your anger break out against the already battered and bloody armor, or the meekness of Rocinante, or the tenderness of my feet, trying to make them travel more than is reasonable. In converse of this sort the whole of that day went by, as did the four succeeding ones, without anything occurring to interrupt their journey but on the fifth as they entered a village they found a great number of people at the door of an inn enjoying themselves, as it was a holiday. Upon Don Quixote's approach a peasant called out, one of these two gentlemen who come here, and who don't know the parties, will tell us what we ought to do about our wager. That I will, certainly, said Don Quixote, and according to the rights of the case, if I can manage to understand it. Well, here it is, worthy sir, said the peasant. A man of this village who is so fat that he weighs twenty stone challenged another, a neighbor of his, who does not weigh more than nine, to run a race. The agreement was that they were to run a distance of a hundred paces with equal weights, and when the challenger was asked how the weights were to be equalized he said that the other, as he weighed nine stone, should put eleven and iron on his back, and that in this way the twenty stone of the thin man would equal the twenty stone of the fat one. Not at all, exclaimed Sancho at once, before Don Quixote could answer, it's for me that only a few days ago left off being a governor and a judge, as all the world knows, to settle these doubtful questions and give an opinion in disputes of all sorts. Answer in God's name, Sancho my friend, said Don Quixote, for I am not fit to give crumbs to a cat, my wits are so confused and upset. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 774 with, with this permission Sancho said to the peasants who stood clustered round him, waiting with open mouths for the decision to come from his brothers, what the fat man requires is not in reason, nor has it a shadow of justice in it, because, if it be true, as they say, that the challenged may choose the weapons, the other has no right to choose such as will prevent and keep him from winning. My decision, therefore, is that the fat challenger prune, peel, thin, trim and correct himself, and take eleven stone of his flesh off his body, here or there, as he pleases, and as suits him best, and being in this way reduced to nine stone weight, he will make himself equal and even with nine stone of his opponent, and they will be able to run on equal terms. By all that's good, said one of the peasants as he heard Sancho's decision, 
but the gentleman has spoken like a saint and given judgment like a canon. But I'll be bound the fat man won't part with an ounce of his flesh, not to say eleven stone. The best plan will be for them not to run, said another, so that neither the thin man break down under the weight, nor the fat one strip himself of his flesh, let half the wager be spent in wine, and let's take these gentlemen to the tavern where there's the best, and over me be the cloak when it rains. I th thank you sirs, said Don Quixote, but I cannot stop for an instant, for sad thoughts and unhappy circumstances force me to seem discourteous, and to travel apace, and spurring Rocinante he pushed on, leaving them wondering at what they had seen and heard, at his own strange figure, and at the shrewdness of his servant, for such they took Sancho to be, and another of them observed, if the servant is so clever, what must the master be? I'll bet, if they are going to Salamanca to study, they'll come to be alcaldes of the court in a trice, for it's a mere joke minus only to read and read, and have interest in good luck, and before a man knows where he is he finds himself with a staff in his hand or a mitre on his head. That night master and man passed out in the fields in the open air, and the next day as they were pursuing their journey they saw coming towards them a man on foot with Alforwas at the neck and a javelin or spiked staff in his hand, the very cut of a foot courier, who as soon as he came close to Don Quixote, increased his pace and half running came up to him, and embracing his right thigh, for he could reach no higher, exclaimed with evident pleasure, O Senor Don Quixote of La Mancha! What happiness it will be to the heart of my lord the duke when he knows your worship is coming back to his castle, for he is still there with my lady the duchess. I do not recognize you friend, said Don Quixote, nor do I know who you are, unless you tell me. I am Tosilos, my lord the duke's lackey, Senor Don Quixote, replied the courier, he who refused to fight your worship about marrying the daughter of Dona Rodriguez. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 775 God bless me, exclaimed Don Quixote, is it possible that you are the one whom mine enemies the enchanters changed into the lackey you speak of in order to rob me of the honor of that battle? Nonsense, good sir, said the messenger, there was no enchantment or transformation at all, I entered the lists just as much lackey tosilos as I came out of them lackey tosilos. I thought to marry without fighting, for the girl had taken my fancy but my scheme had a very different result, for as soon as your worship had left the castle my lord the duke had a hundred strokes of the stick given me for having acted contrary to the orders he gave me before engaging in the combat, and the end of the whole affair is that the girl has become a nun, and Dona Rodriguez has gone back to Castile, and I am now on my way to Barcelona with a packet of letters for the viceroy, which my master is sending him. If your worship would like a drop, sound the warm, I have a gourd here full of the best, and some scraps of tranchon cheese that will serve as a provocative and wakener of your thirst if so be it is asleep. I take the offer, said Sancho, no more compliments about it, pour out, good Tosilos, in spite of all the enchanters in the Indies. Thou art indeed the greatest glutton in the world, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and the greatest booby on earth, not to be able to see that this courier is enchanted, and this Tosilos a sham one, stop with him, and take thy fill. I will go on slowly and wait for thee to come up with me. The lackey laughed, unsheathed his gourd, unwalleted his scraps, and taking out a small loaf of bread he and Sancho seated themselves on the green grass, and in peace and good fellowship finished off the contents of the alforwas down to the bottom, so resolutely that they licked the wrapper of the letters, merely because it smelt of cheese. Said Tosilos to Sancho, beyond a doubt, Sancho my friend, this master of thine ought to be a madman. Oth said Sancho, he owes no man anything, he pays for everything, particularly when the coin is madness. I see it plain enough, and I tell him so plain enough, but what's the use? Especially now that it is all over with him, for here he is beaten by the night of the white moon. Tosilos begged him to explain what had happened him, but Sancho replied that it would not be good manners to leave his master waiting for him and that some other day if they met there would be time enough for that, and then getting up, after shaking his doublet and brushing the crumbs out of his beard, he drove Dapple on before him, and bidding adieu to Tosilos left him, and rejoined his master, who was waiting for him under the shade of a tree. Don Quixote Chapter LXVI 776 Chapter LXVI 
of the resolution Don Quixote formed to turn shepherd and take to a life in the fields while the year for which he had given his word was running its course, with other events truly delectable and happy. If a multitude of reflections used to harass Don Quixote before he had been overthrown, a great many more harassed him since his fall. He was under the shade of a tree, as has been said, and there, like flies on honey, thoughts came crowding upon him and stinging him. Some of them turned upon the disenchantment of Dulcinea, others upon the life he was about to lead in his enforced retirement. Sancho came up and spoke in high praise of the generous disposition of the lackey Tosilos. Is it possible, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that thou dost still think that he yonder is a real lackey? Apparently it has escaped thy memory that thou hast seen Dulcinea turned and transformed into a peasant wench, and the knight of the mirrors into the bachelor Carrasco, all the work of the enchanters that persecute me. But tell me now, Didst thou ask this Tosilos, as thou callest him, what has become of Altisidora, did she weep over my absence, or has she already consigned to oblivion the love thoughts that used to afflict her when I was present? The thoughts that I had, said Sancho, were not such as to leave time for asking fools questions. But o me, senor. Is your worship in a condition now to inquire into other people's thoughts above all love thoughts? Look ye, Sancho, said Don Quixote, there is a great difference between what is done out of love and what is done out of gratitude. A knight may very possibly he proof against love, but it is impossible, strictly speaking, for him to be ungrateful. Altisidora, to all appearance, loved me truly, she gave me the three kerchiefs thou knowest of, she wept at my departure, she cursed me, she abused me, casting shame to the wind she bewailed herself in public, all signs that she adored me for the wrath of lovers always ends in curses. I had no hopes to give her, nor treasures to offer her, for mine are given to Dulcinea, and the treasures of knights minus errant are like those of the fairies, illusory and deceptive, all I can give her is the place in my memory I keep for her, without prejudice however, to that which I hold devoted to Dulcinea, whom thou art wronging by thy remissness in whipping thyself. And scourging that flesh minus would that I saw it eaten by wolves minus which would rather keep itself for the worms than for the relief of that poor lady. Senor, replied Sancho, if the truth is to be told, I cannot persuade myself that the Don Quixote Chapter Lux Vi 777 Whipping of my backside has anything to do with the disenchantment of the enchanted, it is like saying, if your head aches rub ointment on your knees, at any rate I'll make bold to swear that in all the histories dealing with knight minus errantry that your worship has read you have never come across anybody disenchanted by whipping, but whether or no I'll whip myself when I have a fancy for it, and the opportunity serves for scourging myself comfortably. God grant it, said Don Quixote, and heaven give thee grace to take it to heart and own the obligation thou art under to help my lady, who is thine also, inasmuch as thou art mine. As they pursued their journey talking in this way they came to the very same spot where they had been trampled on by the bulls. Don Quixote recognized it, and said he to Sancho, This is the meadow where we came upon those gay shepherdesses and gallant shepherds who were trying to revive and imitate the pastoral Arcadia there, an idea as novel as it was happy in emulation whereof, if so he thou dost approve of it, Sancho, I would have ourselves turned shepherds, at any rate for the time I have to live in retirement. I will buy some use and everything else requisite for the pastoral calling, and, I under the name of the shepherd Quixote eyes, and thou as the shepherd Panzino, we will roam the woods and groves and meadows singing songs here, lamenting in elegies there, drinking of the crystal waters of the springs or limpid brooks or flowing rivers. The oaks will yield us their sweet fruit with bountiful hand, the trunks of the hard cork trees a seat, the willow shade, the roses. Perfume, the widespread meadows carpets tinted with a thousand dyes, the clear pure air. Will give us breath, the moon and stars lighten the darkness of the night for us, song shall be our delight, lamenting our joy, Apollo will supply us with verses, and love with conceits whereby we shall make ourselves famed forever, not only in this, but in ages to come. Egad, said Sancho, but that sort of life squares, nay corners, with my notions, and what is more the bachelor Samson Carrasco and Master Nicholas the barber won't have well seen it before they'll want to follow it and turn shepherds along with us, 
and God grant it may not come into the curate's head to join the sheepfold too, he's so jovial and fond of enjoying himself. Thou art in the right of it, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and the bachelor Samson Carrasco, if he enters the pastoral fraternity, as no doubt he will, may call himself the shepherd Samsonino, or perhaps the shepherd Carrascan. Nicholas the barber may call himself Nicoloso, as old Boskin formerly was called Nemoroso. As for the curate I don't know what name we can fit to him, unless it be something derived from his title, and we call him the shepherd Curiambro. For the shepherdesses whose lovers we shall be, we can pick names as we would pairs, and as my lady's name does just as well for a shepherdesses as for a princesses, I need not trouble myself to look for one that will suit her better, to thine, Sancho, thou canst give what name thou wilt.